Well, welcome back. This is Chris again. The date today is April 26th, year of our Savior 2016. April 26th, 2016, Bible study number 41. Yes, Bible study, Bible study number 41. The title is Pagan Rome Part 2. Yes, Pagan Rome Part 2. So just to recap, we were talking about Pharisees were a religious party or school among the Jews at the time of Christ and was a priesthood that became genetically and morally corrupted. It became corrupted through the infusion of the Babylonian religion. Exoterically or outwardly, uh, the Jews at Christ's time practiced the Israelite religion, but esoterically or inwardly, they were practicing the mystery religion. This was the reason behind Jesus Christ's scathing denunciation of the Pharisees and Sadducees, as recorded in Revelation 2, verse 9. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So I know the blasphemy or irreverence of them that claim to be Judites or real Jews, Israelites or Hebrews, but are really the congregation or the people of the serpent, which is the red dragon, Satan, or Lucifer. Now, understand that that's people that uh, Israelites uh, definitely did partake in Satanism. So this is about condemning a religion, okay? Not a specific people. Now, Jesus Christ called it a synagogue of Satan. This statement proclaims Phariseeism as a satanic religion, John 8, 44, with a garment of, or superficial covering of Christianity. To these hypocrites, Jesus reserved his most scathing uh, condemnations. All right, so we're going to, my brother Stephen's going to read Mark 7, verses 9 and 13. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Okay, uh, I'm going to read Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28 states, Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. All right. So the Pharisees assumed the outward appearance of religious scrupulosity or ethics, all the while they were conducting pagan rites in secret. The elders of Judah in the temple of Solomon conducted such rites as the Lord revealed to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. Phariseeism is the tradition of the elders that neutralized the word of God. This leaven or tradition morphed into the Babylonian Talmud today embraced by the religion of Judaism that rejects and hates Jesus Christ. It's not Christian, folks. It's the religion of Satan as Jesus Christ proclaimed. So we see that this Babylonian tradition was also carried forth by the Essenes to Alexandria, Egypt, where it was mixed or grafted into the Word of God. Alexandrian Gnostics were the spiritual heirs of the Essenes after Hadrian had suppressed the order in 132 AD. Thus the religion of syncretism, the fusion of different religions into one, was passed from Essenism to Alexandrian Gnosticism. Alexandria, Egypt, after the destruction of Jerusalem, became the most prominent, most important center of Jewry outside of Palestine. The evidence of the church fathers proves that Gnosticism was the work of Jewry which is esoteric or hidden paganism. For they named several of the leaders of the Gnostic schools as Jews, followers of Judaism. Remember, uh, Herod, uh, who was an Edomite, murdered the last true Israelite uh, high priest, Aristobulus III. So we see that the Alexandrian Gnostics were a seen Jews, the strongest, most dangerous sect of Alexander Gnosticism against Christianity was that of Valentinians, which were led by Valentinus, behind whose false Christianity St. Irenaeus discovered and exposed his Jewish identity. 
After Valentinus' death, his disciples developed his ideas into a system which they spread throughout the Roman Empire. During the first century, the Apostle Paul had valiantly contended against the Judaizing heresy, giving no place to the unbelieving Jews who stalked him from city to city, agitating the crowds as he preached the gospel. All right, it's taken from Mystery Babylon, the great Catholic or Jewish. All right, my brother Stephen's going to read Acts 20, verse 19. Acts 20, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. See, Paul clearly identified these Jews as, um, Thou children of the devil, thou enemy of all unrighteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? All right, so the next reading is going to be Galatians 2, Galatians 2, verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Okay, now it says right there in the scripture, according to the word of God, these were false brethren. These were not true Christians, okay? And uh, they came in privily. They worked secretly. Uh, they work through disguises or garments of Christian phraseology. And that's why the Bible says that the simple, uh, the simple are the ones that get punished. That's why he says, be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. So these Jews, these false brethren, were infiltrating the churches and bringing in false doctrines secretly. They were false or faithless, treacherous or not true brethren or Christians. They were counterfeit Christians. So the next reading is going to be Romans 10, Romans 10, verses 2 through 4, and verse 9. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine, in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, so we're seeing here that the, the Judaizers or these false brethren, uh, Judaism, whatever you want to call it, it is a works-based religious system. And as we're tracing it, this esoteric or mystery Babylonian system landed in Rome and uh, it was blended in and that's where we get Papal Rome. So we see that Paul knew that after his death, Jewish wol uh, Jew wolves would penetrate the church. These heretics would Judaize the word of God. So the next reading is going to be Acts 20, 29 to 31. Acts 20, 29 to 31. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Watch there, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sacrificed. Sanctified. Oh, sanctified. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. So Paul was preaching a gospel of faith to the church. And that's what we're all about is preaching a gospel of faith to the church to uh, who, uh, whomever wants to hear about the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, so that, that's important. We're about the Bible. Uh, the Bible is one complete book. It's not, uh, uh, it's not two parts and it belongs to these other people here. You're justified by faith and then you can move forward. So this sanctification or justification was through faith alone. A Christian cannot, cannot earn his salvation. This was in contrast in opposition to justification by works, the Judaizers' doctrine. 
So the next reading is going to be Galatians 2, verse 16. Galatians 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. See, there are, there are um, sects of, of Christians out there that are caught up in all these specific days and times, uh, and you have to go through this specific religious system, and they, that really what that becomes, and they believe, they're like, well, it's right in the Bible. But if you're not looking at it from a perspective of the New Testament that it is a free gift, and that um, then you're really moving forward in a workspace religious system. So we see that the early, earliest connection between the Jews and Western Europe was made in the city of Rome. This Jewish population soon began to take part in the political and cultural life of the city. Many of those who visited Rome stayed and the Jewish population began to grow. From the second half of the first century AD, the Roman Jewish community became firmly established. In centuries following the death of Julian in 363 AD, the Jewish Virtual Library records a Jewish revival in Rome. Quote, during this period, there was a revival of Hebrew studies in Rome centered around the local Yeshiva Met Metivta de Mata Roma, or Romi. Well, I've recognized one word, Romi, Rome. A number of well-known scholars, Rabbi Kalonymus B. Moses and Rabbi Jacob Gaon and Rabbi Nathan B. Jehil, who wrote a great Talmudic dictionary, the Araka, contributed to Jewish learning and development. Roman tradition, uh, Jewish tradition followed those practiced in the land of Israel, and the liturgical customs started in Rome, spread throughout Italy, and the rest of the world, end quote. Now that's taken from the Jewish virtual library, under Rome, subsection, the Christian Empire, and that's taken from www.jewishvirtuallibrary.org. Now, I understand it mentioned liturgical customs. Now, liturgical is referring to uh, rites and rituals and ceremonies conducted by mediators or the professional clergy, the ministers, uh, between God and the people. And so, uh, right out of your collegiate dictionary, it says a right or body of rights prescribed for public worship. It's different between public and private worship. See, I can have, a, I privately worship to my Lord and Savior every day. I talk to Him. I say, Jesus, I need you. And I'll confess my sins to Jesus. Okay? And then I'm accountable to my brethren. And so, but notice that it's a body or body of rights prescribed. Prescribed means by, that's a prescription by an officer, by a government official. That's by like a, from a licensed physician gives a prescription. Not anyone can give a prescription. All right, so we see that the Roman Catholic liturgy is a religious syncretism. See, the Roman Catholic liturgy borrowed from Judaism, borrowed from Mystery Babylon. Okay, so this applies to uh, all races, folks. This isn't just picking on one race here. Um, so we see here that uh, my own ancestry, uh, there are a lot of people uh, that keep, uh, that keep the, the liturgy. Um, that's where you get into the seven sacraments and everything centered around the Eucharist, which is a bloodless sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the Roman Catholic liturgy is a religious syncretism or blending of Oriental mysticism, Greek paganism, Alexandrianism, Ale Alexandrian, Philonic or Philo Judaeus, and Kabbalistic Judaism, and Christian ideas of salvation chemically combined. The, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is a fusion of all these systems. Judaism and heathenism or paganism concealed in a garb of Christianity were designed to pass into Christianity through a recondite or secret or hidden means incomprehensible to one of ordinary understanding or knowledge concealed. So a lot of this stuff is really, really hard to detect. 
So Judaism, with its religion and sacred writings and Greco-Roman paganism, with its secular culture, science, and art, were designed to pass into Christianity to be transformed and sanctified. This was a two-pronged attack from Greco-Roman heathenism and Judaism, which were two branches from the same Babylonian tree. The Greco-Roman religion was exoteric, or outward, in its polytheism, or multi multiple gods, while Judaism was an esoteric, or hidden, polytheistic, or multi-god religion. This was concealed beneath the guise of worshiping Jehovah. Combined, this Christian church is really an ertzat, or substitute, or synthetic church. The heathen poison was disguised beneath the Jewish customs and therefore became more palatable to those without the unction of the Holy Spirit. See, for you to recognize these things will take the Holy Spirit to recognize these things. Those who had the Holy Spirit rejected the poisonous Babylonian and Judaic customs and contended for the true faith that was once delivered to the saints or Christians. And that's really taken, that, that passage is taken from Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great by Edward Hendry, Great Mountain Publishing, 2011, page 14. All right, so we finished another chapter. Now we're going to get into Papal Rome. So now we have, we're tracing this Babylonian religion. It has many different fronts, but this is a Game of Thrones by Lucifer. And so he works in a very recondite and gradual uh, perspective or technique, modus operandi, or method of operation. So now we have Papa, Father, Papal, Papal, actually, Papal, late Latin, uh, Papa, relating to a Pope or to the Roman Catholic Church. This is taken right out of your collegiate dictionary. Papacy or Papacy from the late Latin Papa or Pope. Number one, the office of Pope. Number two, a succession or line of Popes. Number three, the term of Pope's reign. Number four, the system of government of the Roman Catholic Church of which the Pope is the supreme head. All right, that's taken from your Collegiate Dictionary. Quote, from the Pope downwards, all can be shown to be now radically Babylonian. The College of Cardinals, with the Pope at its head, is just the counterpart of the pagan College of Pontiffs, with its Pontifex, <coughs> Pontifex Maximus, or Sovereign Pontiff, which has existed in Rome from the earliest times, and which is now known to have been framed on the model of the grand original College of Pontiffs at Babylon. The Pope now pretends to be, uh, uh, pretends to supremacy in the Church, as the successor of Peter, to whom it is alleged that our Lord exclusively committed the kings, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, uh, they believe that Peter was the uh, leader of the disciples. Well, that is wrong. If you're a biblical, uh, according to biblical Christianity, or Bible-believing Christians, or according to the word of God, Jesus Christ was ahead of the twelve disciples. Continuing to quote, but here is the important fact that till the Pope was vested with the title which for a thousand years had had attached to it the power of the keys of Janus. Now Janus was the ancient Roman god of beginnings and thereby of gates, doors, and hinges. All right. So the keys of Janus and Sabel, and that's where you see when you're looking at the Vatican City flag, you'll notice the keys of the pagan gods of Janus and Sabel, okay? And then you'll have in the center of it, you'll have the, the, the crown, I believe it's called a tiara, and that has three layers, and that's referring to as this um, pagan ruler he controls uh, heaven, he controls earth, and he controls hell. So he is a god. All right, so Roman doors being hung on pivot hinges. So it's a reference to the door, um, having the keys to the door. No such claim to preeminence or anything approaching to it was ever publicly made on his part on the ground of his, of his being the possessor of the keys bestowed on Peter. 
So this isn't really referring to Peter, it's really referring to paganism. Now understand that Papal Rome is a blending of paganism and Christianity. <clears throat> and now you'll see in the Vatican Museum, you'll see a statue representing Janus Bifrons in the Vatican, uh, Vat in the Vatican Museum. <clears throat> now have usually kind of a two-headed figure. Now very early indeed did the bishops of Rome show a proud and ambitious spirit, but for the first three centuries, their claim for superior honor was founded simply on the dignity of their see as being that of the imperial city, the capital of the Roman world. When, however, the seat of, the, of empire was removed to the east and Constantinople threatened to eclipse Rome, some new ground for maintaining the dignity of the bishop of Rome must be sought. That new ground was found new when about 370, 378 AD, the Pope fell heir to the keys that were the symbols of the two well-known pagan divinities at Rome. Janus bore a key and Sibel bore a key, and these are the two keys that the Pope emblazons on his arms as the ensigns of his spiritual authority, end quote. Now that's taken from the most hated book of Rome, one of them, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, Chapter 6, Religious Order, Section 1, The Sovereign Pontiff, page 206. Pontifex Maximus equals Pope. Now remember, Pontiff meant bridge maker, Pontiff. Now, Maximus was maximum bridge maker, which was the bridge maker between God and the people. And that was just, that was changed into Pope. And so it's Christianized. These pagan terms were just Christianized. Emperor Constantine was the first Pope. Pontifus Maximus equals Caesar, and Caesar equals the Pope. Remember, Jesus says, render the renter to uh, Caesar the things that are Caesar's, which is basically stating and render to God the things that are God's. So this is, this is Jesus Christ clearly confirming that he recognizes that the God of this world is really governing the affairs of this world. Okay, that's Lucifer. And so, uh, quote, Junior emperor and emperor called the 13th apostle in the east, the son of Const, uh, Constantius the first Chloris, junior emperor in St. Helena, Constantine was raised on the court of co-emperor Diocletian when his father died in 306 AD. Constantine was declared junior emperor of York, England by the local legions and earned a place as a ruler of the empire by de defeating uh, of his main rivals at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. According to legend, he adopted the insignia of Christ, the chi ro, and placed it upon his labrum. Now, the chi ho isn't what you would think of as like a Templar cross. I wish I look it up. Chi ro, C H I dash R H O. Uh, it's actually uh, kind of looks like a P with an X in it, and I think that might be where you get kind of the uh, the pharmaceutical symbol. I could be wrong, but. It's very similar. And placed it upon the labrum. Now, his symbol, Esai, placed it upon the labrum, which is the military standards that held the banners of his armies carried into battle to vanquish their pagan enemies. His purple banners were inscribed with the Latin uh, for, in this sign, conquer. Constantine then shared rule of the empire with uh, Licinius, Licinianus, exerting his considerable influence upon his colleague to secure the declaration of Christianity to be a free religion. When, however, when, uh, Licinius and Constantine launched a persecution of the Christians, Constantine marched to the east and routed his opponent at the Battle of An Andrianople. Constantine was the most dominating figure of his lifetime, towering over his contemporaries, including Pope Sylvester I, he presided over the Council of Nicaea, that's where you get the Nicene Creed, gave extensive grants of land and property to the church, founded the Christian city of Constantinople to serve as his new capital, and undertook a long-sided program of Christianization for the whole of the Roman Empire. Well, he baptized a Christian only, while he was baptized a Christian only on his deathbed, 
Constantine, nevertheless, was a genuinely important figure in Christian history and was reserved as a saint, especially in the Eastern Church. End quote. And that's taken from Catholic Online, Catholic.org, Catholic Encyclopedia, St. Constantine the Great. Constantine claimed to have seen a cross in the sky with the words, In hoc signo vinces, or in this sign conquer. The cross and the words, In hoc signo vinces, or IHS, became the battle standard of the Papal Roman Empire. Constantine's division of the empire into two halves was the fulfillment of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2, verse 33, his legs of iron, his feet of part iron and part clay. So you see this iron kingdom is now divided into two parts. So we see that Emperor Constantine began to fulfill Bible prophecy when he founded a new capital for the Roman Empire in Constantinople. Pagan Rome ended, Pagan Rome ended, and Papal Rome began with the cross. Imperial Rome became Papal Rome on October 28, 312 AD, when Constantine exchanged the eagle for the cross. All right. And not only so, but he, Constantine, also caused the sign of the salutary trophy to be impressed on the very shield of his soldiers and commanded that his embattled forces should be presided in their march, not by golden eagles as hitheretofore, but only by the standard of the cross. Now understand that Rome conquered, uh, when they conquered the known world, they just adapted all their pagan gods, okay? But that started to lead to a lot of confusion, okay? It become, became very factious. So Constantine, being a brilliant man, a military genius, he saw Christianity as an agent or as a system to standardize everything. So we'll pick it up next time. Uh, God bless you. Just remember to search all things and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God bless you.